Uh, today, I yeah. Good morning, by the way. Uh, I'm uh, so I'm I'm really happy to be here. Um, I just want to share some experiences I made in like the past ten years uh, when uh, how I actually share how I stumbled into the community, what made me do staying uh, doing this for ten years probably, and um, address many things that you probably are overlooked or not not that visible if you just attend conferences, of course call hey start contributing because it's fulfilling it's very enjoyable and and it's, it's also like a, a very unique thing we have here in the community uh, let's start with a disclaimer um the images are generated by ai so um there's always bias in ai so the it was some time spent a lot of time spent to make them representative to be inclusive for everyone but sometimes yeah there's bias everywhere just like sorry if there's a, a stereotype um not we didn't catch uh so and of course any people People you see uh, any similarities to living or not, no longer living people as purely confidential. There's also a second warning. Uh, some images might just too be cute to be true. Um, and, and this is this is me. So I run my own data and I consultancy for more than 10 years. And I this year I started a community nonprofit called Pioneers Hub. Um, and these are the, some or the most of the communities I like just like to support. It's PyLadies, EuroPython, RuroSciPy, our local PyData, Sudwest Meetup in, in Southwest Germany, uh, PyConD in PyData Berlin, and the Python Software Verband, where I'm also uh, a board member. And how does many people often ask me, how does this make sense? Yeah, so are you just working in communities? Are you no, I'm, I'm working in data and AI as a consultant. And and uh, I also love that, but I also love getting the input from the community. And actually, for me, if you just put passion and communities I do care about together, it also makes sense because it, it really helps me also uh, professionally to learn new things in a community because where would I be without the YouTube videos where people share knowledge with something I need for my work? So it's... I love to do it, I love to contribute, but it's also that you get a lot back, and I think that's just so really amazing. And yeah, so I would like to also like like uh, share my, my journey, because actually it was just like a, a unexpected journey. So um, in the 1910th, like, like 14 years ago, um, there was a, 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 the first wave of data science and all the stuff came up and I, it was a thrilling time and I also wanted to change programming languages and so should I use JavaScript or Python? It's a really hard choice at that time because JavaScript was way more popular uh, then and data science, new, new scientists, a lot of learning, big data, no SQL databases, it, there was a lot of innovation going on. and and. I'm just like there somewhere. Okay, I want to reorientate. Uh, let's go somewhere. Let's learn new things, try new things out. And uh, so actually, um, I um, attended EuroPython 2014 in Berlin as an attendee. And uh, the, PyCon, the EuroPython uh, then was run by uh, um, the German Python Software Verband. Um, it was still like the the concept EuroPython uh, used then, and yeah, some, somewhere in this picture, this is me, and uh, yeah, just a, a attended. I really liked it. I session chaired. I was lucky to session chair for Valerio Maggio. Uh, we also became friends, <laughs> and so you see sometimes how connections just build. You meet people, um, and uh, you talk, and you do things. And also there was this satellite event, this Pi Data satellite event. It was actually the second Pi Data in Europe. Uh, I also attended it, and yeah, it was really, really enjoyable. Um, uh, and and actually, I attended, I volunteered, and this basically was the result of that. Um, so I joined EuroPython as an auditor at at the uh, venue. Um, there was like a, the EuroPython Society assembly, and uh, yeah, so nobody wanted to be auditor. And at that time, it was like, okay, can you review like 10 invoices? Yeah, we need that because for our bylaws, I say, okay, I can do that. And okay, half a year later, I was program co-chairing with 
Alex Savio working on uh, um, uh, the next EuroPython in Bilbao with strangers via email I've never met. And I was said, okay, this cannot really work. How should this work? And actually the magic is it really worked. We had like 1,200 people more in a beautiful venue in Bilbao. I met all the people I was working there for a month um, for, uh, yeah, at the, in person there at the time. Um, like uh, uh, having video calls wasn't a thing back then, really. Everything was email and email threats. There was no Slack. Slack wasn't even around yet. So, um, so actually, yeah. So I really enjoyed uh, working as a in the program because it gave me also like a really broad perspective of what's around. It's not just like things I'm working on. I have also have to read um, abstracts where people hand in, make a big proposals for things I've never heard of. And that was always really helpful sometimes after a few years. Oh, I read, I read a proposal somewhere. And that could help me again also in my work life. Um, I, uh, I learned so, obviously I like the community, so I also joined uh, the EuroPython Society um, as a director for two years. And then on at EuroPython, uh, people from my area who also like I knew from EuroPython, Sebastian and Peter came by and said, hey, what about doing PyCon in Karlsruhe? You want to help? Well, sure, it's my area. I have I have expertise, I can contribute and experience from your Python, and okay, this is how I got involved into PyCon D. And I, am, I was also helping a bit at your SciPy, and the program chair left, and Valerio just wrote in the your SciPy chat, oh, I think Alex should do that. And I said, okay, yeah, why not? And so one thing just led to another, um, but also like seeing what works well and not in um, uh, community conference organizing, because it's like a pop-up company in a way. I mean, you have a big conference, uh, you have a few th more than a thousand people or a few hundred people to, to manage. It's, it's, a, it's a reasonable budget you have to navigate. Uh, thing, things can also go south. Um, and I learned, okay, there is, and it's sometimes really hard just to ramp this up just for one year and after the conference, okay, party's over next year. Everything, everything's hibernate and you have to push back to bring back things to life for the next conference again. And um, I saw like uh, this has been, this was one of the reasons I joined also the port uh, of the Python Software Verband because I really felt the need, we need to improve processes, things, the back office, and it also lead me let me even further um, founding uh, Pioneers Hub, um, a nonprofit for the beginning of the year um, to support c building tech communities and helping tech communities with mentoring, processes, administration, all the, all the boring stuff, yeah, um, uh, because I, I really think they can foster and I think they bring so much value for everyone. It's a really necessary thing and good thing to do. So, okay, some more joy after the party. So this is like EuroPython closing with all the volunteers here. This is photos of our local um, PyData Südwest meetup. And this, for example, was taken at PyCon D in PyData Berlin. So you see, actually, it's it's enjoyable, <laughs> as you might see. And um, and I, here I want to share some more learnings and advice on my journey so far. So. I've written even a Zen for community organizers. And it's it's actually also on GitHub. It's this is like version one. So if you have anything you want to add or say, just do a PR. I will also we can also go a bit uh, deeper later. Um, the Zen, I mean everybody knows the Zen of Python, I, I guess, right? Yeah. So it's like okay, some guidance, how to run good conferences, good teams, and what, what's the mission. Um, so uh, let me tell you a little bit more about organizing in the Python community, because this is a quite unique thing. Very few communities have this healthy culture, and many people make conferences um, or user groups um, self-organize. And this is very powerful to be self-organized, because many other programming conferences, there's a company behind it. They do. They do, uh, they do it for profit. They hire people who are probably not um, too much, too deep into the topics uh, that are discussed at the conference. And yeah, there's totally different incentives than basically doing a conference for your peers and um, other people around you. And um, so 
I think this is this is really great and unique, and uh, this is some something we should really value and treasure in in the community. Um, uh, very often, the local or national multi, uh, especially large events, are backed up by um, an organization, um, and. I think one of the really great things is the major decisions are made by the volunteer organizers. So there's nobody, no business person say, okay, this is, we have to do this because we can say, okay, it's all the call of the organizers. There's even public votings for, um, for the program, for example. So it's very, it's really including everyone who's also attending. And I think this is also a great way to listen to multiple aspects of people who want to attend a, a conference. Um, yeah, and some examples. So there's just some local folks running a local meetup. Usually there's uh, one or two people driving, many other people helping. This is like a, a, a very common pattern um, that uh, there's not uh, there's not too many people to step up. Say I'm I'm going to take the lead. Um, there's many people who want to help, but the leading part is sometimes a bit harder to find. And national associations like PyCon Italia for this conference, uh, the Python Software Verband for PyCon D in Germany or EuroPython Society for the EuroPython Conference. Um, one example for um, what's uh, done by volunteers is the program selection is done by volunteers who work on a program committee. Then executives, also the executives, because this sounds like business, right? B a bit businessy, probably. But let me um, say, um, like the executives I'm referring to are actually the elected board members, for example, from EuroPython Society, which are also elected by the community and come from the community. So that's not, uh, yeah, this is, I think, very good to have um, organizations also run by community members. And of course, finances, um, management and risk um, assumptions need, uh, need to be done by, and also like an association, because of course, if you get a venue like the Mediterranean or um, a venue in Berlin, of course, this is, it's a few thousand, hundred thousand euros to rent <laughs> the BCC in Berlin, and you need an organization to handle that. Also, for example, to handle it in case maybe a pandemic happens and you don't have to close everything down. You have some, some money in the bank that gives you like stability. And I think this is the very important thing we should also treasure having community-run organizations that have some money in the bank that can provide a stability, even in the, sort of make us survive a pandemic, which is quite impressive, actually, <laughs> that we we did. Um, I like not, not like personal like this associations. Yeah. So there was so, so that was that, that's that's really good. Um, and the stability and having money in the bank makes us also really resistant to sell out being like sponsors, we can treat sponsors as partners, not as, oh yeah, we may need to make the sale, we need, we need the money, otherwise we cannot pay the other bill. So I think this is, this is very, very, very important that we can always act on a high ground and say, okay, if it doesn't work, we maybe have to cut the budget, maybe we have to do some things because we cannot afford. Usually that doesn't, that doesn't happen or sometimes happens. We cannot say, okay, this is too expensive, um, but uh, we, we never depend on making that sale and because i think that's always like a, a bad not not a, not a healthy thing if you think about quality of contents authenticity authenticity and many other things um yeah and community organizing is actually is i would argue it's an excess um we have a very welcoming community culture established um the content we do is authentic. It's not sold to anyone. Um, people from the community share their experiences, what they just learned or what they are working on. Um, and it's, uh, it's, not, it's not product pitches. Um, the community selects what it wants to see. Um, also like the committees are diverse and um, there's also like room not only for popular topics. Uh, the committees also look into, okay, this is a niche topic or this is something new which is relevant for maybe fewer people as well. So let's to include that in the program as well. Um, we are very, very beginner friendly. There's beginner's day like here, uh, which I think is great. Um, we really, really try to tear all down all the walls. Hey, just come by, join us, don't be afraid. We don't bite. <laughs> um, so I think this is really awesome. Also like to to get to, yeah, to tear down walls because many there's many walls in people's heads like, oh, I cannot do that. And I think we're doing really good on, hey, just come by. It's not that, not that bad <laughs> or part to 
stop, start programming or contributing. Um, we have a strong focus on the whole attendee experience and focus also a lot on diversity and inclusion. And everybody in this community is also very accessible. So another fun fact story, because I just learned Python. I just wanted to apply Python to solve things and to program and even after I was program chair of EuroPython for a year, so I just learned, oh, Python is written in C, I didn't know. Like, uh, I mean, and, and people were just like some core developer was explained it to me and said, no, and he didn't think, oh, well, what an idiot. And I was just like, no, it's written Python, it's a C, and, but don't, don't worry too much about it because most of Python is still written in Python, yeah? So you really don't need to go down to the level because I was never really interested in C programming. So I want to, I want to get things done, I want to solve things. I love programming, but I probably, don't, I don't like compiling things, stuff like that. So I don't, I'm not interested. And one more thing, like, we, we, we create content and insights and share knowledge at the conferences, not only with the audiences in the room or people watching the stream, we record the videos and they are released on YouTube for free. And there's another great story. Um, I was with a colleague on my way to um, the conference in Berlin. And we were sitting like in the train, table for seats. And we were talking about a conference and then a person just across the table said, Hey, what are you talking about? I know this conference. What's your involvement? Yeah, we are organizers. And how do you in a conference? And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm from Nigeria. I learned from some of your conference videos and now I'm a machine learning engineer in Germany. So, and he said, okay, oh, there's proof. It's not only theory, there's real, a real person sitting here and this makes really sense. And um, I think this is very, very uh, important and a really great contribution. Um, so, uh, so I also have some counter examples for other conferences, for example, like many uh, just sail out to maximize profit. There's even like free developer conferences with like every 12,000 people. We have the CEO of GitHub. I mean, it's more like fan fanboy stuff, I think. Uh, it's very often uh, the program selection is, if you look, from, for example, there's one conference series in Germany. I think it's the same people on the program committee since I know this conference for more than 10 years. It's always the same people. It's always the same speakers. Like, or like a lot, not, not exactly the same. So they see there's closed networks, um, there's a lack of diversity and inclusion. Um, there's so, very often the content is just shallow. Why? Because if there's no competition about, hey, who gives the best talk, who makes a great proposal? I mean, if it's just like, okay, I have to talk at this conference again, oh, the, the motivation is a bit different. Also, there's like VIP bar barriers. Of course, people sometimes like to, oh, I'm more important as a speaker. And I think, of course, people like, for example, we give free speaker tickets, but we also point out, this is a thank you for your contribution. This is not a privilege. Yeah? So it's just like, hey, this is a thank you because we know a talk, you can spend like multiple days doing a great talk or weeks even. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and, and very often also the content is gated and never released to the broader public. Um, and the fun thing is, because I don't know really why the I mean, there's many theories about the, or theories about why is the Python culture like as it is. The I think the, the one the the, the 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 leading theory is all the people who did Python and were early in the community were just like this, and this basically educated everybody else who joined. Um, also, the community organizing is built in and access for more than two decades. So this is not a new thing. We have these conferences for a few years. Actually, it started in 2002. And actually, EuroPython, not the Python, not the PyCon US, was the first big conference by, or big, it was 200 people, but PyCon US also had only 200 people in their two years. It, it started in 2002. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, EuroPython is going on for like 22 years, like, uh, which is like crazy, uh, um, if you think about it. Uh, and it's always volunteer run and, uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, carried, carried out by the community. Um, and you see, but also like here, the conferences grew, and it's really hard to say, uh, because for example, EuroPython, EuroPython was here at PyCon. There was no PyCon Italia, there was three years EuroPython. It was only planned for two years, but then nobody wanted to do the EuroPython, so PyCon Italia said, okay, we do another year. It was exactly in the same hotel here, and it was like a very, yeah, it was like very um, 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 popular conference, and they said like, okay, this is too much to have to handle for the lo for local communities. Uh, we have too few organizers, and you see this somewhere here. I would say 
running something with a smaller group until like three, 500 people is handleable. But it actually, once you meet, have like a certain amount of attendees, it gets way harder to, to navigate. And um, so, um, so I think uh, there was also like, uh, yeah, this is, this is like a break where no local community can handle also like the financial risk and organizational risk because people do have, do they study, they have a day job and this contribution is weekends, nights, sometimes nowadays in open source, uh, also some nice employers. Um, give people free time to contribute to open source and conferences. But uh, yeah, so yeah, so and nowadays, for example, in Berlin, we had 1500 people on site. Um, this is a, this is like a, it's a major event It needs has different needs to to navigate. Um, so I'd say community organizers also need a stronghold. Um, what's a stronghold? Stronghold is some examples of of the of, of uh, community organizations I've mentioned before, like the PSF, the EPS, the Python Software Verband, PyCon Italia, um, because I think it's very important to one to have like that can bear financial risk, navigate the budget, um, also think about mid and long term strategy. Where should the next conference be, for example, and all this? Um, we're quite happy to have these organizations, but they also volunteer run, and also the boards are volunteer elected. Um, so still. Um, it's also like sometimes people fade out or say I um, don't have so much time. Um, so and so what do orga these organizations uh, or other organizations like Pyrodines Hub now also takes care of is I mean all the boring stuff like legal requirements, bookkeeping, filing taxes timely, uh, negotiate agreements with uh, venues, uh, um, sponsors, infrastructure like have accounts for um, organizing the work, um, uh, tools, um, payouts for grant programs and having the receipts in according to local tax um, uh, requirements, reimburse expenses, reg meet regulatory requirements for example also data protection I think we can really do better there we're not working on uh, private Gmail accounts most of the time so um, there's a lot in the back office this is probably not visible if you are in uh, um, uh, if you're just attending or con you're contributing in a committee um, and so and so that brings me to the next second part so organizing what are opportunities on challenges so and uh, so let me first define Organizers and volunteers. So, what's what's the difference? Is there a difference? Uh, actually, there, there is no official definition somewhere. So, I would uh, basically define it like this: Organizers take responsibility for a certain part. They are chair of a committee. They are responsible for organizing the reviews um, or um, take take care of an important part of infrastructure, build it, maintain it, make sure it's op uh, operational, um, or like a substantial subtask. And for or for example, are part of the code of conduct team at the conference and also open to say, okay, let's uh, attend a professional training um, to know what they are. Yeah, so the professional code of conduct training, and volunteers as I, volunteers give a hand. Um, it's just like a help from time to time, um, smaller tasks, session chairing, um, uh, conference desks, just like yeah, helping out. But wouldn't say important, but not necessarily mission critical. So organizers, I would say organizers do mission critical stuff because if we don't have a program, it's it's nice to meet you all, but uh, yeah, we can just chat all day. But if there wasn't a program, nobody would probably want to come to the conference. Um, so yeah, that's that's um, a light definition. Um, so what are community organizing challenges? So again, here are our the, all the, the goals. Yeah, welcoming culture, authenticity, inclusion. I always like to phrase it because many people think, oh, it's community, it's volunteers. They think we are just like. Also, like, just like uh, sometimes I get like the feelings that people think, oh, yeah, yeah, it's just like these nerds, like uh, they like to do their stuff. And I think, no, no, it's uh, like these conferences are run by experts for other experts. Or I would also like to add for experts to be because the beginners are also part of this. Yeah, so it's not, we're very, we just want to do things for ourselves to learn. We don't need this served by somebody who doesn't really know what we care about. 
Um, we have a very strong focus on the experience and diversity and accessible people. And there's also some challenges because you see we have this welcoming community culture, but you also have to maintain it and you have to communicate it. Um, for example, in the opening session, we always do in the opening session who's, who's first time around. Um, and also say a call to people, okay, if you're around, uh, who knows the um, Pac-Man rule? Yes, okay, few, okay, what's the Pac-Man rule? The Pac-Man rule is just to point people, if you stand in a circle, always leave a spot, a spot open, so somebody else can fly in and join the conversation and just invite people, because people are shy, especially if the first time at the conference, you know, like there's imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome is you, uh, you compare your own knowledge to the knowledge of the group, nobody can win that, but also it's like, hey, come on, join the conversations, uh, don't be afraid, also like to say, don't be afraid to ask questions, there are no stupid questions. I just revealed something very personal, not knowing Python is written in C after being program chair. So, um, yes, so, but it's important to, to also like to do that because nobody knows everything and, and it's, it's really great what you can learn from people if you just ask the question and say, okay, I have this problem or I'm struggling with this, so my another strategy I like is going to meetups and complain in the pizza breaks. Um, and, and yeah, and there's always a person, oh, have you heard this? This is the solution? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's really cool. Um, so, uh, but you also have to make sure, uh, like making everything diverse, it's also like work. You need to, to check, to look into, okay, how's the program team? Do we have, for example, beginners in the program team? Um, do we have, uh, like, of course, a gender distribution? Um, do we have representation in, in, in the team to cover as many aspects as possible. That's also something really not look, has to have to look into. And, um, and of course, uh, you have to consider everything around it. Food, food allergies, uh, affordability is very important because of course, having a nice venue, which is expensive, is great. A lot of our attendees, especially like in Germany, get, get, the pay, get the ticket paid by the employees anyway, but we know there's, it's probably not as affordable for students or people who are new in their jobs, so we have to set up a grant program, have ticket, different ticket pricing, but also have to look into, hey, how much is the hotel and traveling to the location? So especially for Europython, this is sometimes quite hard to figure all this out for multiple potential European cities we are looking into, hey, travel, accommodation, ticket prices, venue prices, it's, it's a pretty complex problem actually. Um, so, and of course, um, uh, have the team also like act as a good example for um, other people and of course also like organize videos and also make sure they are released after the conference because it has happened in the past, the videos were never released because hey, the conference over, mission accomplished, everybody hibernates and oh, nobody thinks about releasing the videos, uh, which is bad, but it happened only once. And it was a small conference, wasn't that bad. So, so the challenge here actually, we have high standards and I think it's very good to have these high standards like um, to make it accessible, enjoyable for, for, for everyone. But of course this brings also like complexity and le le workload um, you need to handle or we need to handle. Um, so, and who's, who's handling, who's looking into this? This is like a prototypical um, organization committees list. So you have code of conduct, communications, making announcements, promotion, uh, like, like letting people know there's a conference, the keynote speakers, about well, informing uh, attendees. Um, there's design swag stuff, um, of, there's a diversity, I think this is a very important um, committee, like to have a diversity a committee, a grants program, diversity has like, hands out like financial aid, has a financial aid program where people can apply, but also reaches out to other underrepresented groups to say, hey, you want to join the conference, you want to give a lightning talk about your community or group and make them, also help them to become more visible. Um, they have, of course, finance, tax, legal stuff um, on site, uh, organizing session chairs, uh, the conference decks, handing out t-shirts, uh, um, make the program. Program is like selecting the talks, uh, the tutorials, organizing being a day. Of course, sponsoring. Sponsoring is, is an important income source to help us to make ticket prices more affordable. Um, and yeah, of course, this is a business thing. And uh, yeah, there's video recordings, websites. So, I say, okay, it's a lot of stuff, so let me, don't let me scare you away with all this stuff that needs to be done, because you only need to, or 
if you join one committee, the, the tasks are smaller, but I think it's always like a great opportunity to, worse, to work in diverse committees, um, big enough to handle the workload um, and to, to learn from each other because the communities are also like, they are a safe, safe space. Yeah? So they, we always try to have experienced and or trained members in the committee, so don't, the committee doesn't really start from scratch. It was pretty hard after Corona because in, after, in the pandemic, teams shrunk, disappeared. To rebuild this after um, uh, after the pandemic again was pretty pretty. It was a lot of work. Um, you need to have to deal with many platforms to communicate and work together. Um, we have to, like, of course, navigate milestones and risk and solving yeah or solve hurdles to participate. For example, in the uh, diversity uh, committee, and so on and so on. There's 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 a lot of things uh, to do. Um, and, and I think the biggest challenge is, yeah, what's the bad thing, what's the big difference between uh, uh, running an event and a software release? Yeah, the event is really hard to postpone, so the, the, the challenge is that ready or not, the door will open, the people will there, they want to go to the conference, and if you have to solve many things before the conference on short notice, that's, that's really bad, and that's really wearing teams out. So I think it's very important to prepare well and quiet. Yeah, it's, it's, I really hate the days before the conference, because I know there's this day, it's going to open, no matter what happens. And um, yeah, and also that's uh, important, because committees depend on each other. So. Um, uh, if one committee has a delay, it might delay the work of another committee. And of course, it's volunteer work. Sometimes people, oh, sorry, some came, came in the way. Oh, sorry, I was sick. And of course, it's volunteer. You cannot really say, okay, you're fi if you don't do this, well, you're going to be get fired. This is not happening. So of course, you, everybody needs to be to, to dedicate to the cause. And I think sometimes uh, sometimes a bit depressing for me because I sometimes sometimes people just ghost and it would be totally fine. Yeah, say, hey, sorry, something came in the way. I just have to leave this committee. It's no hard feelings. It's voluntary contribution. But not knowing and waiting for decisions of a member you want to include can also cause delay. So it's 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 really fine also to say, okay, something came in the way, or I lost interest, whatever, or no reason at all. Um, yeah, but it. it it doesn't happen that that often anymore, uh, uh, which is really nice. Um, uh, I think a very the, the, the very important part is not to miss milestones, to really stay on track because milestones missed just will keep like increase the whole pressure and uh, on the on committees and the work. And the, the bad thing, milestones missed, the, the task will catch up to you anyway. So and um, so I think an authority, yeah, I didn't find a better word of the authority um, <laughs> that ensures that everything is on track and on time helps a lot. I think it's a really good practice to have somebody who's not within the team or like one of the volunteers or not the program chair, it's somebody just like somebody from outside, it can be a mentor, say, hey, how's the milestones going? How's this? Just like to push the team. Oh, yes. Sometimes because people just sometimes forget or say or are not aware it's it's getting a, a pressing matter now. Um, the, the right, the great thing is like organizing and helping in these many, many fields you can contribute. Um, uh, you can learn and grow a lot. You can try out new things. Uh, you can, you can, uh, it's, uh, it's, you can try things. You can work with like-minded people in a, in a safe space. So if you don't know something, it's totally fine. There's a very low barrier to ask, hey, what's the experience? What should we do? Sometimes there's also like new new challenges, which we don't have a solution yet. Hey, develop a solution for, for that. Um, I think it's very enjoyable, especially everybody's really friendly and helpful. Um, and uh, yeah, and you can improve your skills in a friendly, safe space. And after, like, let me show you just like a picture after one day of ramping up the conference, running three days of the conference, the PyCon D and PyData, this year's teams, I mean, we still look happy, right, in the closing session, <laughs> yes? So, and this is like, this was the team of organizers and volunteers, not everyone, some people had to leave earlier, but you see, like, it's a huge team, we could carry the whole conference on many shoulders, which made it um, really, uh, yeah, really great experience for everyone and deliver a great conference because 1,500 people, I was a bit afraid, eh, to be honest. <laughs> so some skills and best practicing for organizing. I think it's very how to build, um, how to build a team of organizers. Um, 
The teams usually work on a yearly event. Um, there's a, we, we do a public open call now, um, uh, but it's important to have concise documentation and expectation management. What are you actually signing up for? This is when we do most of the work. This is the expected time you to contribute because people don't like to sign free checks for doing everything. They rather say, oh, don't do anything if you don't define it well. Um, and also, uh, I think it's very important to select people more by motivation than expertise, yeah, because uh, um, there's many non-technical skills, uh, like also like non-technical non-technical tasks needed. Yeah, I think it's very important. People are motivated. They also see yeah, let's make this a great experience. How can we accomplish that and uh, and select people like this? Uh, it's very nice we have experienced organizers uh, at least around as mentors for um, the, the um, in the teams because uh, it's uh, it's always good if you say hey what was your past experience um, a little bit more in a minute about that and it's also important to make sure that the, the teams meet regularly but when there's actually something to do because like some of the on-site team like meeting with the on-site team half a year before the conference is quite pointless because there's nothing really to discuss so don't keep up the meeting so usually they start earlier the first two committees that start early or should start as early as possible is program team and diversity diversity program because we need to select the program and that's reading 500 proposals and making building a schedule diversity because we have many people who need to also apply for a visa um, this takes time and also um, booking travel early is more affordable so and then can, can we can make better use of the budget um, so this is this is why we try to open this um, as soon as possible um, there's also some other best practices from experiences um, where I think it's very important the committee chairs are also team leads I've never seen a really great performance of a team if there was not one or two or three people together leading a team like, because if you have people, sometimes you have a mix of people, they're happy to contribute to tasks, but sometimes people don't really want to lead a team. That's, that's just a reality. Or if you're in a volunteer organization, probably you're already leading a team in your day job and you just want to do, relax from that. There's many different reasons. And I think it's very important to make sure each team has uh, at least one person leading it. Um, it's very important to work on healthy committee collaboration, uh, a little bit more on that, what can go wrong there. And um, also like we I learned like big general meetings for everyone, bore almost everyone out because at that time there's 80, 90% talking about the program. If you work in other committees, 50 minutes left for nothing. So um, the better strategy is have the committees meet regularly and be transparent and have like the, the committee chairs think what's to do. But of course, if somebody is interested in something else or like wants to know, of course they can join and listen in. Um, it's open, but usually people are just focused on what they signed up for. Um, so uh, yeah, and and also it's important to manage ideas and capacities, um, which brings uh, um, that because yeah we covered the skills uh, already. I'm speeding up a bit um, because don't don't be afraid of ha not having skills. We need many skills, and there's helpful people that can learn. Don't don't be afraid to sign up. Yeah, um, uh, you're part. You will be part of a group of helpful people um, yeah, for example we also need beginners in the program committee because if we just have advanced talks at the conference it's not very beginner friendly so we also need this perspective even if you're new in the community um, some other experience from the past for example I, this is very typical I've also uh, who has worked in other associations like a sports association and, or a board something different context no, no one Oh, well, maybe Rodrigo, maybe a bit, uh, Artyom, okay. But you know, many people like to join boards um, or uh, a committee and they say, oh, I have this great idea, I have this great idea, it's this great idea. And, and I think it's very important to have a healthy culture and to really say, hey, ideas are very welcome, but execution plans are even more welcome because we don't never never lack ideas. We lack execution, yeah? and it's uh, sometimes really hard because some people think their ideas are so great and such a great contribution. Yeah, um, so I don't want to talk bad about having these ideas, but you see, oh yeah, just giving the ideas and waiting for others to execute it. This is not. This is not really good. Uh, so. Um, 
Also, like mentoring is not like secretly chairing. So I, I learned it's very important to say, uh, um, okay, this is the experience we had in the past. This is what we try. These were learnings, but always like to conclude with, it's my two cents. It's your call to make because sometimes you even have like experienced team leads like looking at you, waiting for a decision because you know, if somebody take, makes a decision, people just like that from time to time. And I said, no, it's your it's your call. I'm just sharing experience. I think that's very important. Very unpleasant thing is team hygiene. So if people will sign up for a committee and not contributing, and I think since. Most, like almost everyone I know in the community, or everyone in the community here, is, is very helpful, um, trusting people. But we also have to face reality. Sometimes people just sign up, especially in the program committee, because it's nice on a CV. They are not really looking for contribute. Um, so it happens, unfortunately. And um, the wrong, I think, it's 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 a bad decision not to address this. So I think it's very important to ask, hey, what is, is, some, is something keeping you from contributing? Yeah, not like, yeah. And, but if there's no answer, it's like we had one person actually once in the program team of Europe, I've said, no, I just wanted my name, have my name here, which was very rude, actually, <laughs> response, but at least honest. And um, But it can really demotivate the rest of the team. If there's just like people lurking in, never contributing, and, and, and then expecting, of course, all the recognition as well. And this is very unhealthy. And uh, something that leadership needs to, is required to handle, of course, in the right fashion, because maybe there's somebody's just too shy and to contribute, and that's just like needs motivation. That's also a thing. So first thing is trust people first, and if uh, you find out there, um, that's uh, they want to meet, they this misuse or whatever we call, want to call it, you have to really act on it. Um, and uh, I think it's very important to define work package as well, so people so people can pick it up, uh, and because and chaos and, and non-coordination really drives people out. They will just leave, they will just go, and you don't know why. Nobody will say, you could do this better, say they just drop, drop out. This is like, so again, I don't want to scare you away, this is just something to help you to improve or have an eye on. Yeah? So it's, um, yeah, because uh, if you look at all the great accomplishments you can make um, is, uh, yeah, reg you have regular conferences, local user groups, meetups to learn, uh, uh, workshops for, for beginners and underrepresented groups. I think in total, just the, Europe, the, the Python conferences I know produce like a, a thousand videos that are freely shared so people can learn them. And, and it's not just like the conference event is over and then that's it. A lot of the stuff remains and is there. Uh, I mean, some, I think some videos, some, some videos you can still like learn 10 years later from. And uh, let me just quick finish with um, potential future directions and what we also need to look into um, into the community. How can we make things better? I think planning ahead even relieves more pressure and can make room for improving, especially diversity, inclusion, um, make trying new things, having time to try new things out. I think that's, that's really important. Um, we do need better governance, especially data protection, because there's a lot of Google Drive so information um, uh, there. Um, and that's not a good fit for what we talk about having talks about data protection in a conference is not a good fit what we preach. So we need to uh, do that better. Um, uh, make contributing easier by having better processes, actually, uh, because there's still some stuff people don't know. I'm joined up. How do I accomplish this? And then somebody might remember it. It would be nice to have this documented um, concisely. Um, and yeah, and. Uh, and, and have organizations that mentor also new users uh, or you, I know user groups in, for example, when they want to found like a new meetup, what do you do? How do you find a host? How do you find a sponsor? Because don't, don't let them have from scratch. So that's basically, we need more foresight and stability for mid and long-term strategy because it just helps to make better, to deliver better events, to make more things happen. And I want to point out, we still post pandemic, especially with user groups and meetups, because many disappeared. Organizers disappeared. There was not the, ne the next generation, basically, usually is the next generation picking up. And then, yeah, the pandemic, old generation left, new generation didn't join meetup. 
closed hibernating. I think there's a lot of work to do because also like in having a local community is really important to help you. So I think it's really Im important we start enabling user groups with frameworks and mentoring how to get started. What do you need? What's a good practice? How do you find sponsors, a room and everything? How do you pay for pizza or make other people pay for pizza? Or do you actually need pizza? Um, uh, and also like, yeah, really foster also like help and foster smaller communities to start to start new ones with all the knowledge we have. And I think it's also not only Python related, that is also like the reason why Pioneers Hub is with an I and not with an Y, because it's tech agnostic. Um, yeah, foster new tech communities with Python culture, because I think this is very, it's a very healthy culture we have established and uh, would like to see this in uh, many other, uh, yeah, it can really be helpful in other tech communities. Um, yeah, so thanks for listening. Um, Thank you very much, Alexander. We have a question, but we have finished the time. I think you have already answered the question. The question was, with the help of other people, I'm starting a local PyData in my city. What are the most important things that we should know and what we should prioritize? You can answer like in one minute. One minute, I think, yeah. Feel free to ping me, um, <laughs> or like whoever asks a question, you can find me on LinkedIn. Free free ping me. Um, uh, I think it's really important to to uh, have a good communication to especially sponsors because if we if you don't have people who already know what a meetup is about. A few slides can be helpful. I mean, I, I, I don't really like to say this because I didn't sign up programming to do PowerPoints in, in now for, for community work, but it's really helpful. Um, find people to help um, and reach out. Just just reach out to the community help. Also, like because I think the probably the first thing is, yeah, how do you find your first speakers and everything? Yeah, and uh, yeah, just reach out. People can help, and uh, yeah, we, I can also. I'm happy to share like a standard slide deck how you can present your um, meetup to a potential sponsor and venue. Um, yeah, so that's that's Thank it. But you. and I think the most important part is yeah, this is the very most important part. Be patient. So your first meetup probably won't be a huge success. Yeah. So the first meetup was a MongoDB meetup. Actually, the five first five the first five meetups, I think we had like four to five attendees, and I pulled through. Eventually, we were more than twenty. Yeah. But it was really hard. Yeah. I mean, like, okay, why am I doing this? We're just like five people. Like, uh, yeah. Uh, you need to enjoy. It. Yes. You need to enjoy, but you also need to be patient. Don't expect quick wins. Um, yeah. no. Thank you very much again. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you.